Okay, good afternoon and welcome to the second session in the Montana Organic Association Organic University. I'm really pleased that you all have made it. Um, we had our first session this after or this morning at 11 and I would say it was a great success led by Doug Crabtree. Um, that is already up on our website if you missed it and would like to view it. Um, it's also on our YouTube channel. So, um, so this next session that we have led by Becky Weed and Tim Seipel um, was something that we tried last year for the first time and it went very well and um, old time organic farmers felt like they got a lot out of it too. So this is a reprise of last year's session on holistic um, farming and systems thinking. And I think Tim, you're gonna start off. Yep, hi everyone. Thanks for coming out and, um, and virtually listening to uh, everything that we got going on. So Becky and I put this session together and it, it partially comes from, I think uh, both of our interests in, in systems thinking, but some of this, and I'll put in some thoughts of my perspective as a um, extension specialist and how we approach some of the problems that we have in organic systems and how we approach the system in general. Um, so this was, uh, this was Fort Ellis, the sheep in the background, that's Fort Ellis where we did the five year uh, organic project with a tilled organic system, a grazed organic system and a conventional no-till system. And we compared some of their responses. Um, and if you're interested, um, there's actually a fair amount of research publications that have come out on microbial communities um, and how they were the, they varied by system and things like that. So if anyone get in contact with me, I won't go into too much detail about it, but I'll just come back to it in a little bit. And then we have a paper that's actually coming out um, in the next couple of weeks and it talks about the differences in systems and how the weed communities varied depending on the different systems. And I realized I didn't put a lot of that in here. So if you guys have questions, ask me about them. I think Becky and I both hope that if we present 20 minutes worth of information about systems thinking, that maybe we could move this into a more open discussion and chat discussion where we can all interact. Cause you guys have some great, you guys have great feedback, knowledge and perspective on this that, that we don't necessarily have. So holistic management is, was really made famous by Alan Savory in, the, in, in, his, in talking about grazing systems. And it was focused often on thinking of the whole picture rather than a reductionist view of the system. And it, it's a systems thinking approach. So how do you manage large systems in your head or you know, how do you manage your agricultural system and deal with them? And the, agri and the grazing management kind of really brought in focusing on how the water cycle feeds back into the, um, our grazing systems, how and grazing management, how does carbon and how does energy flow in those systems? So nutrients um, and all kinds of primary productivity and different things like that. And then it also is about community dynamics and ecosystems and how parts of the ecosystem get put together and how they function interacting with each other. But systems, and so holistic management really comes from a systems thinking approach, maybe as it's as one step higher on the hierarchy when we think about it. And so systems thinking or systems theory, it's often, gets called is, and the system is interrelated and it's of interdependent parts. And so it's a complex arrangement of elements and changes can affect parts or the whole part of the system. And systems ecology or ecology is really the study of how organisms interact with other biological organisms and interact with their environment. Um, focuses on interactions and transactions within these biological systems, our agricultural systems that we're working in. And so 
I actually could talk about sort of systems management, systems thinking for hours and hours on end. But when we think about it, there we have to recognize they're very dynamic systems. The systems we talk about are not static, non-dynamic systems. So we deal with lots of things. And when we think of our complex systems, there's all kinds of different things that go into them. But in agricultural systems, we have to think about evolution and adaptation networks of how things interact with each other, how collective behavior changes socially based systems or individual agents within a system, um, how different game theories interact with that, and then how we have lots of nonlinear dynamics or things that can interact that aren't on a sort of one-to-one -one thing that we, we have nonlinear dynamics to them. So, you know, you can get synergies or things can break apart and, and things can break down. And so I think that's a lot of the complex thinking and the complex system, systems thinking that we have. Um, so where did my systems thinking begin? And luckily enough in my twenties, I spent a lot of time bumming around the world, climbing mountains, climbing rocks, doing all kinds of things with people. And many of them are, are amazing climbers who go on and give all kinds of talks around the world and like that. But it, it really, when we think about climbing a mountain or doing something for the first time or interacting in these complex environments, often my thinking falls back to what I learned in, in systems thinking and how we get up a mountain. What's, how do I take this system? How do I make something like this possible when not necessarily people have not necessarily done it before? And one of the things we have to understand is complex interactions, very complex interactions. What's good one day is not good the next day. Complex decision-making, knowing when and why we make our decisions, remembering those systems are dynamic and remembering that there's often no single prescriptive cure. And that's one of the things that I often come to an extension when people ask me as an extension specialist, they want a prescriptive cure for a problem that they have. And that for me is the hardest part because I often wanna say, well, what about your system? What system are you doing? And why do you need this sort of prescriptive cure that may or may not exist, but what can we do to think about it in a more systems-based approach as we come into it? And so that's really where my I come into thinking a lot about this kind of stuff. So agricultural systems, super complex. These were my faba beans this year. Look at that nodulation. I mean, that's some beautiful nodulation that I had on these fabas, but at the same time, you can see that leaf that's sneaking in there and the fabas on the other side is field bindweed. So I have more problems with field bindweed and other weeds. And I have to think about how to manage these complex systems sort of oriented problems of managing weeds, recognizing yields, understanding soil health benefits and all these things that go into it. Um, so there was a paper in 2017 by um, Caitlin Peterson, and she really put this together in a resilience sort of thinking of how we think about our, our agricultural systems. And in most conventional systems, we tend to be very prescriptive. We can add a lot of nitrogen, add a lot of certain fertilizers at any point. We can add irrigation water. We can bring in imported pollinators, herbicides, insecticides all these different things. They're very reactive external regulation. But when it comes to thinking about an agricultural system or how we manage it from an organic perspective, we have to think of preemptive sort of things that we're gonna take. We're gonna think through the system and work through the system because we don't necessarily have that ability to apply a herbicide that's going to do some, you know, going to kill something that we want it to kill. So we have to think of, you know, our nitrogen carbon cycling and how we're managing it, water conservation and storage, 
uh, soil conservation, how we deal with weeds in organic systems. It's really difficult. How we deal with insects, pests, and disrupt disease cycles. How we provide habitat for pollinators and how those affect or and for predator insects and how those affect weed seed predation, how they affect other types of predation. And then we think about it in this system and we think about the ecological, agricultural, and social outcomes, right? The three pillars of sustainable agriculture, economically viable, socially just, and environmentally sustainable. And so a lot of what's gone around in the sort of physics world and state theory, very complicated stuff is thinking of this ball and cup diagram, which is what's kind of in the center of this focus. And we want to keep ourselves in a productive system, as productive as we can get it, but one that's guided by internal ecological regulation rather than reactive external regulation. And so a lot of what come, has come out of physics is thinking of the ball and the cup. You want to make the cup as productive as it can be, and you want to keep that ball in the cup. You don't want it to slosh out like in the lower diagram into an unproductive state. You want to maintain that resilience. And that can be done in a better way through thinking of these internal regulations and ecological outcomes and complex systems thinking. And I think that leads to increased sustainability, but I'm happy we can discuss that as we move on. So I thought I would share a little bit about under, um, and why we need to understand the ecology of the system. And this is the example that I talked a little bit about last year when we started this. And it was a, it was a really great project that Darren Bosch, Darren Boss thought of at Northern Ag. And we came in on the tail end of it and measured a bunch of the initial outcomes. It was a cropping study that um, where they replaced fallow with a number of different cover crops and cover crop mixtures and looked at some of the different impacts um, from forage production to subsequent yields to we looked at microbial communities and weed suppression. We looked at fungal communities and bacterial communities to really focus on soil health. And that was our team that we had listed in there. So it began in 2012 and it was a wheat cover crop rotation and fallow was our control check. And so we had different phenologies and different diversity mixtures that were in the project. And we also put out these rain out shelters and um, soil warming devices. So collective heat, heat collectors. And we were really interested in the outcomes and whether they differed among the, among the different systems. So we can, here's where the mixtures of really what we looked at most closely, but there's a lot of different mixtures out there. So we had an early phenology cover crop mixture, a mid-season cover crop mixture with more species, had seven species in it, with some warm seasons in there. Um, we had some uh, German millet for the warm season, and I think we had some soybean in there in one year. And so we had a different cover crop mixtures and we looked at their outcomes through in our research. And so- This is how much each of the mixtures oh, produced in- Sorry about that. I realized I did not delete something. There we go. I had to delete some taping in there. So the, we looked at the biomass of the cover crops and the relative abundance of the cover crops. And we looked at it in the early and the mid season and under warmer and drier conditions. And one of the most interesting things that you notice, first of all, is that the ambient conditions and the warmer and drier conditions had similar amounts of cover crop biomass, which is not something we would necessarily predict because you would say, well, it's warmer, it's drier, wheat yields would be lower, crop yields would tend to be lower, but we had these mixtures of, of the crops in there. So why was that? Well, the oat biomass in our mixture, if they were, it was in the early and the mid season, the oat biomass, it really declined 
when we had warmer and drier conditions. So the oat went down. Might make sense if we think about how oat performs and why we don't grow too much oat in Montana, but there's definitely the oat biomass went down in the warmer and drier conditions. But what happened is compensated to that in that mixture, the turnip or the mustards, especially the mustard cover crops, they started making way more biomass. And so there was a compensation. And I know Doug and I had a little bit this conversation last year. We talked about, well, mostly the monoculture cover crops or a, they make as much biomass and you get as much out of them as you do a very complex mixture of 10 to 12 cover crop cocktail of things that barely would grow in Montana. And so we're on the two extremes maybe of this, but what, but really the mixture was valuable partially because this was the ambient on the left and then popped up just on the right. That is the radish biomass. We did have some Philly beetles in there, but really we had that turnip and radish that took over and compensated for those. I realized that I'm going a little too fast here. Let me um, stop the timing of that. Hopefully it slows down. So we, we measured these trade-offs additionally. So we looked at the fallow and this is the soil moisture that we have right here. And we have the soil moisture. You can see the fallow in the ambient. We did a pretty good job of conserving moisture. The more negative, the less soil moisture we had. Winter wheat's in the bottom right corner. You can see that really winter wheat was using the moisture. That upper profile was dropping fast. Then we had the haver field days a couple years where we'd always get a thunderstorm and then the soil moisture would go back up slightly. And you could see the early season mixture was using water in the same way that the winter wheat was basically, the two on the right. And the fallow, maybe we can serve some moisture. There's a reason people did fallow for a long time. It does conserve soil moisture, but it brings all kinds of other problems as we know. Um, so let's move on. So when we talk about the wheat yield, the first year when we had the fallow early and the mid season cover crop in there, basically there was a warmer and drier effect in the first year where wheat really under warmer and drier conditions, our wheat yields were much lower. In the second year when we did the project in what would I would have thought was a kind of similar moisture year, but maybe after eight years of this project, we had drained that lower moisture profile. We had the early and mid, they yielded much lower. So there was a trade-off. We're losing ye wheat yields out of that because of a, probably because we're draining the lower profile of the soil moisture that was in there. So there's some trade-offs. Some years it may be there, some years it may not be there depending on moisture and timing and the complex relationship we have going on. Um, but what we did get out of the cover crops we used more moisture, but we had less weed biomass. In the early season cover crops, they covered that surface. Their phenology was good. We had that, we had that early season cover crop. We reduced the amount of weed biomass in, in both the ambient and the warmer and drier conditions. So there was an advantage in weed suppression there, even though we're maybe costing ourselves some yields. Um, what we found was really interesting, and I think we're working on the publication, getting it out the door right now, is we found more beneficial mycorrhizal fungi, AMF, in the early season cover crop mixture, right here in this middle bar that I'm circling. We had less AMF in the mid season mixture. We don't really know why, but then also less. AMF fungal richness in the fallow system. And then when you go over and you look at the pathogen abundance, so what we did is we extracted all the DNA, we sequenced the fungal DNA to find out how much was there and, um, and what their identities were based on matching them. So we could say, okay, we found these DNA sequences, they correspond to a fungal pathogen. And so what we found was in the fallow system, there were more fungal pathogens that were present than there were in either the early or the mid-season cover crop. So we're making this trade-off. There's a lot of advantages 
to having a cover crop in there. And if you're maybe thinking of it from a real reductionist point of view where only yields are mattering in this context, then there's cover crops are harder to justify, but you get a lot of benefits out of cover crops. And so when you bring it into a complex system, there's important benefits that we get out of those. Um, so basically I was just gonna say in summary, we have trade-offs when we're using cover crops, when we're making our agricultural decisions, especially in these in the ecological systems. Um, the trade-offs were more soil moisture usage and lower wheat yields, but better weed suppression, more beneficial fungi and fewer pathogens. So I have some weird timing going on in my PowerPoint, but I'll basically say, when we think about these systems, it requires complex systems thinking. And so it's really important to think about our organic systems, realizing the trade-offs that we're making and the complex systems that we're working with. And so when people ask from an extension point of view, what's your prescriptive solution, often I bring it back to, it requires complex system thinking to think of where we are in this system now and what we can do to change those management systems going forward. So with that, I'm gonna basically hand it over to Becky to talk for a few minutes. So we can get some of Becky's thoughts on integrating livestock into some of our organic cropping systems and the possibilities. And then after that, we'll open it up to questions and discussion in the chat and I look forward to it. So with that, Becky, the floor is yours. Uh, thanks, Tim. I'm not sure if that slide is meant to imply that I think like a sheep, but uh, <laughs> uh, I'll take it. No, I was just, uh, I, I had to add a good sheep photo in there. It's a cool slide. Um, yeah, well, Tim um, actually put this together. I can't take any credit for that. Um, but I think it's pretty clear from the examples he was just talking about looking at a cover cropping system that um, whether you're looking at the specifics of your farm field or whether you're looking at your whole farm or whether you're looking at how your farm fits into the larger ag community, um, it's pretty site specific and dynamic. And um, so I think maybe the most important thing to keep in mind is that there aren't clear cut recipes that are gonna apply across the board. Um, and you can learn a lot from looking at other people's examples, not so much because they give you a path, but they can help help you develop a way of thinking about it. Um, last year, I can't remember exactly how this discussion went, but similarly, we, we did talk about cover crops and there were some arguments and questions about how and why people's experiences were really different. A lot of it had to do with the simple variable of water, but um, but that's not the only issue. So I guess really, I think both Tim and I are most interested in, um, in getting questions and comments from you guys and we can talk about it. And I guess the only thing that, that I wanna keep in mind is that, um, you know, Tim's example is a very specific agronomic example that has repercussions for how we think about grazing and farming and harvesting and all that. Uh, but it's also true that for those of us who are actually wanting to farm, um, we often have to expand our systems thinking way beyond the field. And that includes labor and cultural issues and political issues and regulatory issues. And um, I think it's valuable to remind ourselves that some of the things that we learn empirically from a, from observing diversity and interactions in the field are equally applicable to our other farm responsibilities and pleasures. Um, so anyway, with that, I guess I'd love to hear comments or questions from anybody on the call. So Becky, how do you use cover cropping and grazing in your system, in your farm? Well, you know, we've been here for a few decades and primarily have been a sheep ranch. And I sort of had a bit of an obsession about never wanting to till anything. 
Um, we, we occasionally would uh, till a field to get some higher protein feed going for the sheep. But in recent years, I've become a whole lot more involved with the local vegetable growing community. Um, and so um, to the extent that we have done seeding on our pasture and hay fields, it's usually involved no-till drills and frost seeding and anything I could do to get some especially more legumes going. But now in working with a few different vegetable people on small portions of our ranch, um, I've had more of an opportunity to try out different crop mixtures. And it has not been a very scientific process to be honest, but it's been fascinating nonetheless. Um, I really, we feel like in our neck of the woods, we have seen a decrease in bird and pollinator populations. And, and, and I think it's partly due to widespread agrochemical use in this valley. Uh, it's impossible, of course, to pinpoint exact causes. Um, all I do know is that when we have certain cover crop mixtures, we can just see explosions of both pollinator and bird populations. And that always feels really good to me. We've also found that um, having the opportunity to bring sheep into a cultivated area can be a really great tool, not only directly for soil fertility, but also um, the sheep in some cases tend to really seek out the perennial weeds that can be a problem in cropping systems. They, for whatever reason, and I haven't found anybody who can explain what they crave, but they absolutely adore bindweed. I've seen sheep stick their nose down through a beautiful stand of sandfoin and clover and come up with a mouthful of bindweed and just have this blissful look on their face. Um, we're, we also on our farm, we're, we've just barely begun something very different here. Um, through a variety of odd circumstances, we had the opportunity to expand our farm this past spring by not a huge amount, but it's one field that's got really good soil, really consistent moisture, very few rocks. And so we're beginning to set up um, essentially a partnership with a few other younger farmers. Uh, Nate Paul Palm is one um, who last year put in peas, lentils, and flax on this field in, as we begin to transition it to organic. But the long-term plan is to set up a rotation with the grains and pulses. Um, the grains and pulses. I got a uh, you know, that's Bob Quinn calling me. I'm not sure what about. Um, and then also a forage harvest uh, grazing rota rotation. And then eventually um, working with Nate Brown and possibly a couple other neighbors to uh, expand the vegetable operation radically. And I don't really feel like it would be possible for any of those things to work by themselves terribly well on this farm. Um, but I'm really excited about the opportunity we have to put together both the human skills and the, the plant diversity to make this system thrive. So it's, uh, it's a work in progress for sure. Is there any questions out there from anyone? I guess I can add a little bit about the Ford Ellis that came around too while you guys are typing or thinking of your questions. So we finished the five-year project in Ford Ellis in 2018, I think. Um, and it was really interesting to see what drove the weed communities for all of you guys who are thinking of, of, of managing weeds like I do most of the day. but it, so one of the big things is we had different weed communities depending on if the crop was a spring planted versus a winter planted crop. So our winter planted crops, we had tons of field penny cress, all our winter annuals in there. But then our spring planted crops, we tend to have we tended to have slightly less weed biomass in there. And then we had a quite distinct weed community from those one that was more reflective of, a, of spring annual weeds or those problems. The biggest thing we ran into with the Fort Ellis project, and it's really continued, it continued on to managing Canada thistle now is in the no-till grazed organic system, 
where we eliminated tillage for 36 months. What we did unfortunately end up with was a Canada thistle infestation that was really limiting in, in that context. So we moved on to really try to understand how we manage Canada thistle in the organic project. And so you'll hear more about that during the student presentations on um, Saturday. Um, they will be recorded and available to watch anytime too, but on the, for those Saturday student presentations, both Dan Chichinsky and Kara Hedinger, who are um, graduate students now, are gonna be presenting some of their results that ended up coming out of it. But when I think of managing weeds and in these organic systems, I often think of, you know, there's no cure, it's a push and it's a pull, and it's try not to get caught by some of these problems that we end up facing. We don't wanna be caught in a cul-de-sac and things like that that make it more difficult to deal with some of the perennial weeds. So we have some rotations that are thinking about what are the preventative cures? How do we use plant competition as one of the projects that we have to best compete against thistle now? And how do we really weaken it in a systems approach rather than sort of a magic bullet or silver bullet approach that we have going on out there? So are there any questions that popped up from anyone? I have one, I guess. Um, I'll jump in here. I, um, having attended Mark Smith's uh, ranch tour last year, I was really, or this past summer, I was very impressed with the whole concept of um, rethinking typical models of, of ranching. How do you, how do you identify those areas um, that you know, you can rethink. One of the things that I was really struck by Mark was that he has very little equipment and for several reasons. Number one, he didn't want to go into debt. Number two, he doesn't like uh, fixing equipment. And so he has selected his cattle and has uh, set up his farm such that he doesn't need to have as much equipment. So what are your thoughts on that? I'll give, I'll let Becky answer that one. Um, well, I think that if you really look at people who, um, who have stamina in farming and ranching, it's usually people who are pre pretty good at figuring out what they like and what they hate. And if you keep trying to do something that makes you miserable every time you wake up in the morning, chances are you won't be able to keep it going. Um, so my hat's off to Mark for, uh, understand, understanding himself. Um, and, you know, I think it's hard for a lot of us who go into farming or ranching, many of us do it because we're sometimes a little stubborn, sometimes like to work alone, um, sometimes a little bit reticent about creating community, um, around ourselves, um, but the longer you do it, the more you realize that having partnerships, formal or informal, can be really valuable and really fun and can really um, help give you more stamina. Uh, and, you know, as far as ranching goes, there are some people who can do an awful lot of successful livestock raising with nary a combustion engine on their place. There are other people who are in love with big iron. Um, and you got to figure out what you like, but you also have to figure out what pencils out. And um, to the people who really have affection for big iron, you kind of have to uh, put a filter on yourself to make sure you're doing something because it's a good idea, idea and not only because it's fun. Um, but there are, you know, I, I really think there are no rights and wrongs. You have to figure out your own family, your own soil, and other aspects of your geography um, and try different things, but there, there are no right answers. I mean, uh, Jamie's referring at one point on, on that field trip on Mark Smith's place, we walked through a field where he has, over a course of several years, has developed really a pretty impressive alfalfa stand amidst his grass. And he's done it 
purely by walking around with a busted shovel for a couple hours in the evening and making a little scrape and sprinkling seed into it and stamping it with his feet and just doing this in scattered areas all over the field kind of for a leisure time with uh, evening activity and um, the alfalfa has really taken hold and really improved the quality of his pasture and you know we're not just talking a, a couple hundred square feet it, it's a a pretty substantial field where he's been able to do this. Um, so there's a lot of different strategies that work. You just have to find out what's sustainable for yourself. Thanks, Becky and Tim. Um, we have a question from Doug and he has an opportunity to develop a sheep wool grazing enterprise integrated with crops and cattle. They have land, forage, even markets just need um, a, sh a sheep manager. Uh, know anyone interested? Well, I don't have hand, but it would be definitely um, worth contacting uh, Pat Hatfield in the animal science department because they, there are a number of students that are interested in sheep. Um, and you never know what happens if you post something on Craigslist. Um, but off the top of my head, I, I don't know of a, a suitable candidate. Yeah, I can't think of a, I think contact Pat Hatfield, that's pretty good. Um, that might, that's a good one. Um, I, I can't think of any students who are out there this summer. Actually, I have an eight-year-old. Do you need an eight-year-old? She, she has a border <laughs> collie and, her, and, her, and they're getting pretty good. <laughs> Oh, she's, she's really interested in it, but we might have to wait a few more years. Um, yeah. Another possibility, um, Doug, I don't know, you know, how much sort of effort and infrastructure options you have or would want to invest, but if you're really serious about it, uh, putting a small ad in the Stockman Grass Farmer magazine could be a really good idea. Um, that way you're likely to key into ranchers who already have a, a non-chemical grass-based mindset and um, could be suitable for your place. Becky, I really liked your comment about thinking about the technology and what you use and where you use it. So my parents were immigrants to the US, my dad was an engineer for International Harvester actually, and I still have some of the last iron that came out of the foundry in 1986. It's our bookends at home. Um, but I also grew up in, my, one of my grandfathers was the village butcher and the other one did a lot of farming, Swiss style farming. So 15, 15 brown feed dairy cows. And you know, that was it, living on a mountain and basically had one motorized engine that would sort of drive things up and down the hill every once in a while. A lot of it was still hand sized. It's a hard thing to make a living on now and those, those guys don't exist as much as they used to anymore. But it was, all, it was a very non-mechanized version of farming, which was pretty interesting. And the sheep actually in this picture I had the opportunity to take students to Morocco in 2014, 16, and 18, and I partner with a, um, a husband and wife team, and the wife, she leads the architectural restoration of rammed earth buildings in this really rural part of Morocco. They're amazing. They're four stories tall, just made of rammed earth, no, no, no power saws, no plug-ins, no anything. And she was working on the architectural restoration and Chris, her husband had been a friend of mine for a long time. He was a football star in Haver in the early nineties. He was, he only lets me refer to Haver as bull hook bottoms and never Haver. Um, but you know, you see a lot of those systems and how they were working. And I mean, some of the alfalfa that they were putting in, they had these amazing scratchers where they would take an oak branch upside down and to scratch in the alfalfa, they had really quite amazing hard oak. So it was very stiff, but it was a great looking tine. I mean, it could have gone onto a machine in the way it scratched in some of the alfalfa seed. We were always quite impressed with it, but it was really great to bring the students there so that they had a relationship to understanding, you know, how people produce their food. And they had a very integrated crop livestock. And these sheep are the local Barbary sheep that they're using to make wool out of 
that goes into a lot of the carpets in Mar in in Marrakesh in Morocco. So it's an interesting system to see and have the opportunity to work in. Well, it is really interesting. Those sheep um, look an awful lot in their body type, like uh, some sheep that I recently got. It's kind of a um, a strange thing I started this year. We we started the year by having some of the worst predator problems we've ever had, and it was really one animal. I think it, I suspect it was a possibly a coyote dog cross. But anyway, bottom line is I felt for that and other reasons that I wanted to try moving towards a more primitive breed, more savvy, more um, just a more robust breed on the landscape. And I got caracals, which are basically derived from a breeds in sheep in Central Asia. They were the first domesticated sheep. And I'm sure it's no accident. They look very similar to the sheep that you saw in Morocco. And I like to joke with people that I see bringing caracal sheep to a 13 mile farm as sort of um, my small scale answer to restoring bison on the Montana landscape. Um, but uh, joking aside, this this sort of push and pull and tension between high tech big iron egg and some very low tech small scale sometimes manual approaches is something that has always been with farming and always will be and um, I feel like I've sort of lived this schizophrenia for quite a few years when Dave and I um, came out here he initially was doing he was he was on the faculty in civil engineering at MSU and started some research working with people in soils and ag engineering and long story short that actually led to a development of one of the first companies in precision ag and so over the last 25 or whatever years we have watched the development of precision ag go from just an abstract idea in somebody's head to a global industry. And so, you know, Dave would be traveling all over North America and sometimes outside North America, helping to work on both the GIS and GPS systems that make Precision Act possible. And then he'd come home to his uh, wife's ridiculous little certified organic uh, grass fed sheep operation. And uh, it has, been quite an education for me to see these two worlds operating on the same planet. And I think it's pretty clear from what we're now understanding better about climate change and a somewhat dysfunctional commodity economy, both domestically and globally, that um, although that set of big ag systems can be very powerful and impressive and can produce a lot. It also has some really serious problems. And um, I think there are some primal appetites in the human species that, that will make some people at least to want to keep re-exploring and returning to some lower tech techniques. That's not to say that the take home lesson is just to turn the clock back. I think to me, it really just puts an exclamation on the point that um, if you're gonna run a farm and you're gonna succeed environmentally and economically, you can't just be focused on yield or number of pounds of meat uh, per acre. Um, you really do have to look at the entire system of how it affects the people, how it affects the ecosystem and how it affects um, larger economic questions. Um, so it's, because of this weird schizophrenic exposure I've had, I tend to really want to shy away from demonizing the individuals who participate in one system or the other. I think it's pretty clear from the chaos in the world right now that nobody has all the answers. Um, and we do best when we learn from each other, especially from those who are different from us. I agree. We do learn best from each other. Doug or Sam, do you guys in your in your operations, does precision ag come into thinking it or how do you fold precision ag or maybe, you know, farming at a couple 50 square foot kind of idea? Does that fall into your sort of systems thinking or how you guys 
manage your your systems yeah that's it's not really it's not something montana milling focuses on um but you know we, we try to support stuff like that just for the fact of the farmer research and and more success with yields and quality as far as organic production goes but it's, it's not something that we physically practice yeah i finally found my mute button um we we use um you know, auto steer and, and that sort of technology just to help us be more efficient uh, in field operations, but we really don't use any inputs. So the variable rate uh, side of that technology is, is not applicable to our system and really not interested in using any inputs. So I, I don't see it going anywhere. Um, th th there's some talk about varying seed rates. Um, Frankly, I've yet to see any evidence that that's really um, effective without uh, being an input heavy system. So um, yes, a little bit, I guess, is the answer to your question, Tim. Yeah, I can back you up on that. Actually, we from Central Ag the last few years, we did a very low input wheat system and we looked at the different seeding rates and we mo yeah, we we actually didn't see a lot of uh, difference either. I mean, we were kind of stuck with 12 inch row spacings, which was way too wide, but yeah, it was interesting varying the seeding rate without increasing a whole bunch of nit synthetic nitrogen input really didn't do much to the system. It was, it was pretty interesting. I was wondering about cover cropping or, or intercropping or things like that in a precision sort of way that might be useful in the future, because I, 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 I think I have a similar view sometimes as, as Doug just sort of stated, when we talk about varying these inputs, it's really varying inputs of external reactive things that I talked about in that graphic. So more nitrogen, more phosphorus, more this, that, but without really thinking of a full systems approach to precision ag. And I think that's maybe that schism that, that Becky was talking about in there. You see, okay, we know these ecological processes are really affecting you know, our yields, how we manage our systems, but we haven't been able to bring that into, or have, bring precision ag into thinking about something that's, that is more ecologically based, other than maybe varying seeding rates or things like that. I'll just comment on that a little bit. You know, it, it's ironic because when, when Dave first got involved in this, he and his partner were, were most interested in the potential ecolo ecological benefits in that it, it does it can allow people to reduce chemical inputs like herbicide when it's more much more site specific um, and to some extent it has perhaps succeeded in that mission but any anyway, we could get into a whole more complicated discussion of what the industrialization of cropping has done um, but setting that um, elephant aside for the moment um, one of the things that I learned from kind of watching this whole evolution, it would come home from these trips where they were, you know, initially just testing out their tools, but he would be hanging around farmers and agronomists and listen to these discussions. And he's an engineer by training, but he would say, oh my God, these guys don't even really understand the nitrogen cycle all that well. And um, the point that it really brings home to me is that in our land grant zeal to have a reductionist approach and pull apart the components of a plant and or animal systems for that matter, we sometimes um, separate the variables so effectively that we're no longer really talking about a natural diverse system. And what people are finding now, I think in modern research, especially in organic mm -hmm. agriculture, but not exclusively in organics that there are things that happen in, in a diverse system that we can't necessarily analyze down to the Nats eyebrow, um, but we can see that they're beneficial. Now there's some people, um, uh, I've just drawn a blank on, oh, Jill Clapperton. There are some people like Jill Clapperton 
who have done extraordinary research to demonstrate the movement of micronutrients and the sharing of signals among different plants and so forth. But even when we can't analyze those processes in detail, we can observe in crop and cover crop systems where um, when there are more species, there is more adaptability to changing climate conditions or different microclimates or different weather extremes in a season. There's all sorts of reasons why um, trying to help our farms mimic natural ecosystems can often be beneficial, even when we can't explain precisely why. Um, and that's offensive language to some technocrats, but I think the proof is in the pudding. As a uh, ecologist in complex systems, there, yeah, it's very, we can't measure, all, it, there's things that, I mean, we get better and better at measuring them, but I think you're right, Becky. I think it's a, it's a difficult thing to, to do. So part of this project that I didn't actually talk about and I realized I should have put in from the Haver project is one of the things we did was we measured the volatile organic carbons produced by wheat. And so we basically, you take like a turkey bag, you put it over, you pump air in one side, you suck it out the other side, and then you like, you filter out all those volatile organic carbons. And the student, Shailen Malone, she was a great student. She's gone on to be a PhD at University of Wisconsin-Madison. But what she found was that when you had wheat in and it had soil that was microbial condition conditioned by a microbial community that had cover crops somehow the system became primed and then when you got attack from wheat stem sawfly the wheat stem sawfly landed on the plant began to attack the plants that were grown in cover crops were able to send a volatile organic carbon signal in greater abundance and in diversity to, to attract the uh, parasitoid of the wheat stem sawfly. So the, the yeah, bracken sepi, I can't think of the common name of it, but it's the parasitoid wasp that attacks it. So it was a really interesting outcome. I never thought we were gonna be able to measure it in the way that we did to get the, the results we did. It was a very complex thing, but basically because that cover crop had affected the microbial community, the microbial community primed the wheat plant. The wheat plant was better able to signal um, that it was being attacked and attract the parasitoid to eat those wheat stem sawflies, mm. right, which is, I, I still am amazed by it. I still think it's so cool. Oh. Yeah, that's a very yeah. cool story. Uh, so, go ahead. No, that, that, that's really interesting, Tim. I, uh, I don't have nearly the uh, scientific explanation, but I know we're, we're in the middle of sawfly uh, infested area and yet I've never seen one stem cut in our organic fields. Um, but last year we grew wheat on a transition field. It was uh, you know, the first year we had farmed it and we were devastated by sawfly. So um, I guess that's some an anecdotal evidence to support your theories that uh, yeah. once, once a biology is allowed to, to uh, exist and, and is natured, uh, yeah. Uh, it, the, the system can take care of itself. Yeah, and that's what I meant by the graphic that's up on the shared screen, that this internal regulation is really productive. And to achieve better sustainability, it's where we have to be thinking in terms of building our agro ecosystems. So I have a kind of a sort of analogous story or question uh, from a vegetable system. Um, we've had a few different people and including myself growing some different vegetables on a four acre area here. And um, I noticed one year when things were really chaotic and there was quite a lot of wild mustard that ended up being next to some brassicas, um, the wild mustard acted pretty much as a decoy and attracted all the flea, flea beetle and it didn't attack the brassicas. And I'm just wondering if you or if you think much is known about what the signals are that would either attract or repel insects like flea beetles. Um, 
or is it just kind of an empirical thing of people experimenting with different plants to, to be beneficial? Yeah, I don't, I, I've heard of people, both conventional and organic producers who plant these flea beetle trap crops that work like that. There's, I, they emit some sort of volatile organic carbon that signals the insect, but I don't necessarily know, you know, there's different rates of the others, but it's also, a, it's a comp, it's a, it's a perfume, if you will. Yeah. It's not necessarily a single molecule that's in that organic. It's a, it's your eau du toilette, your, your, <laughs> really your, your mixture of complex perfume. And I don't think we'll ever know exactly what all the signaling is going to be, but it's a, it's, it's a, yeah, there's a, there's a, a scent in the air that tra attracts that that does this attraction. But I, I don't know exactly what attracts, what makes one mustard more attractive than the other, but that's be really interesting. Yeah. But I do know people plant flea beetle trap crops out there just to call in the flea beetles. Yeah, several years ago, I was at an eco farm conference and I met a guy who, um, he was in Salinas Valley and he started growing vegetables as an eighth grader. He just grew tomatoes and he got so excited about it. He became an organic vegetable farmer. He's now raising 1,200 acres of all brassicas, cauliflower, broccoli, all crops like that. And his entire system is based on about, uh, I think it's like, I'm not sure, six or 12 foot beds of brassicas alternating with six foot beds of alyssum. And that has enabled him to essentially grow 1,200 organic vegetable acres with no chemicals. It's kind of amazing. Um, there's one question from Robin, Tim. Uh, she says, I'd appreciate a revisit of the resiliency thinking slide you shared earlier, 2017 research. She didn't quite catch what you said about it. Oh, okay. Sorry. I probably skipped through it. I've spent a lot of time talking about it. Um, so basically it was a paper about how to increase resiliency in agricultural systems. And it was a, it, it's a conceptual paper but it talks about, and I think the key points are having external regulation that's reactive on the right. Those are our, our inputs. That's what Doug is basically trying to avoid. And then really relying more on internal regulation of our ecological systems through the interactions in ecological systems, through these things that we've sort of been anecdotally talking about. And one of the things that people used to talk about in ecology literature, maybe a little more than they do now, but it comes back when we talk about resiliency, is basically if you look at the top blue line that swirls through there that goes down and up, is you have, it's called the cup and ball analogy. And what we want to do is keep our gray ball in the productive side and not let it slip into a different state or uh, go through a state transition that makes it less productive. One of the examples I can think of when we talked about this in some of my research work was looking at how cheatgrass responded after fire. And you know we talk about cheatgrass being a horrible invasive species in the inner mountain west into parts of Montana and really you go through a cup and ball of where you have nice sagebrush country. And then if you have too much fire, too much disturbance, that ball sort of rolls out of the cup and ends up down in the under unproductive side or the lower cup. And it's hard to go back from transition to transition. So by having ecological resilience in the system, it's basically we're building the walls of the cup higher so that we keep it into a system. And you can imagine we have good years and bad years, depending on moisture, right? That's the sort of back and forth arrows in the top center right here. And you know, you, but we're keeping it in the productive side. We haven't destroyed the soil health. We haven't pushed it over into the right side yet where we're in an unproductive state where we might have too much soil acidification or, you know, too much, things that reduce our productivity out of the system. So the idea is really 
when we rely on internal regulation of a lot of these ecological processes is you keep it within the cup right here and you don't have a very shallow cup where it's easy to roll off into the other side. That's very that helpful. Yeah, thanks. Yep, thank you. Mm -hmm. Any other questions out there? I can't really see the chat all that well. Uh, Mark asks, so what about the cheat grass? And what about the cheat grass? How do we keep it from going into that system? Sorry about this. Get back to our cup and ball. Is that so correct, Mark? So the cheat grass, how do you prevent cheatgrass and losing it? You, so cheatgrass can be incredibly invasive in our rangeland, but most often in highly disturbed rangeland where you've had too much grazing historically, where you've weakened our native bunch grasses and our native grasses in our natural range. So if you ask me how to prevent cheatgrass invasion, I would say avoid overgrazing. So really like killing, what I mean by that is killing the native grasses that we want to be there. Two, minimize soil disturbance. So cheatgrass loves soil disturbance. You apply a lot of soil disturbance, it loves it. Um, and by doing those two things, you have a resilient sort of sagebrush grassland, sagebrush steppe ecosystem that in and of itself is resistant to invasion. Does it mean there won't be cheatgrass there? No, but it won't be in such a high overabundance that it's gonna to cause too much detriment. And the interesting thing was what we found in Montana with this study was when we bur it burned, it was a natural fire on the Red Bluff sheep station east of Bozeman, or west of Bozeman, that even the burned, was resilient and most of it recovered really quickly. They put a bulldozer line in there to as a fire break that became a cheatgrass nightmare and required management intervention. So to keep a resilient rangeland, I think you have to think of this it, systems thinking works for it in the same way too and thinking of these agricultural in ecological interactions. Yeah, and then Mark asked a follow-up question. Um, once the cheatgrass saves the soil, say after fire, how do you then move the vegetation back to productive side? And um, that kind of is right along with the comment I was going to make about Tim's statements. You know, everything he said is true, but then it, it begs the question. So say you have some disturbance, whether it's fire or overgrazing or whatever, where cheatgrass does move in, uh, what then? And really, I think, um, well, I have two comments on that. In general, disturbance can be a tool if you do it with grazing or some other means, but then you have to put in something that's capable of out competing the cheatgrass and then giving it the right rest conditions so that it can continue to outcompete the cheatgrass. Because if you get a great stand of something going and then you abuse it the next year with too much mowing or grazing or whatever, then the cheatgrass will be the one to rear its ugly head again. Um, but this also raises a question in, um, about our current conditions, and, and this is one of the reasons cheatgrass has become such a common topic of discussion. Um, there are different categories of plants, C3 and C4 plants, that use a different photosynthetic pathway, and it turns out that some plants, um, and cheatgrass is one, along with other perennial weeds, uh, they actually do better under elevated CO2 conditions or higher CO2 concentrations in the atmosphere. So now in the face of climate change, when we have elevated CO2 conditions, it turns out that tends to favor some undesirable plants like cheatgrass. So it's just yet another indicator of how complicated the repercussions can be when you change one variable in a system. It doesn't mean you can't overcome the cheatgrass, but there's no question especially in a lot of these really arid parts of Montana, it's a big challenge. Um, so if you're gonna do it in a, in a livestock system or, or any kind of a cropping system, either way, you have to ask yourself, what can outcompete cheatgrass and what can I do to, to support that effort to outcompete cheatgrass?
think getting that perennial production in there is pretty key quite often after. It was really interesting. Red Bluff was native range and it was amazing. The, the native grasses basically survived the fire because it was mostly a low intensity fire. And they came back great the next year after that, which was really, that, that was great to see. So you, you realize that there was um, resilience in the system. But I think there are instances where we actually have to manage and deal with it. And thinking, as Becky said, thinking about those ecological outcomes, what plant is gonna be the best competition against cheatgrass? How do I smother it out? How do I deal with sort of moving in transition pastures or thinking about things like that? I think it's really important. That kind of reminds me of another, um, it's, it's sort of a different story, but it's kind of related to that issue. Um, I've heard Casey Bailey talk about how um, he had this naive idea when he first got started that if he, if he was gonna start farming without chemicals in a field that had had, had chemical control, he thought, oh, this will be great. There won't be a big weed seed bank and I'll be able to get a good clean start. And I had a similar naive idea on this new field that we have. There's a field to our north that has been managed chemically for years. It was in grass and alfalfa, but then it's been in a no-till barley system that was managed uh, chemically very intensively. And um, they put in lentils on part of it, flax on part of it, and peas on part of it. And it turns out that there was an enormous weed seed bank in that field that nobody knew about. We have kind of a lamb's quarter forest out there. Um, and the lentils, because they tend to be low growing, are really lousy at, at shading out the weeds, whereas the flax and the peas did a lot better. So, you know, it's just another illustration of no matter what type of system you have, it's those competitive relationships between the plants and the weeds and among cover crop plants that really often um, takes control. Becky, did you have a pretty good patch of Canada thistle out in your pea field too? Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, uh, I didn't want to call you out on it, but. <laughs> well, that, that patch has been there. Um, and we had, we did a lot of puzzling over that patch because at one point it looked so horrible out there that uh, some people thought maybe somebody had spilled some chemicals on that field and the previous previous ownership, but I've investigated pretty hard and I think it is mostly a pass that developed during a period when that area was, it got way too wet. There was a ditch that was, it was really some natural sewer irrigation that had been diverted and then it got kind of undiverted. So anyway, there was a whole bunch of thatchy grass and equipment disasters that have happened with previous owners in that area. Um, and we're gonna find out next year whether we're able to tackle it successfully or not. It, you, you, um, so when we talk, we're gonna talk about this on the student projects and then there's an MSU update on the second with Sam's gonna chair that one, I think. And uh, so at Casey Bailey's this year, one of the things we did, and I don't wanna, spill the beans too early is we ended up mowing over the top of it and it really did a good job of like at least keeping the biomass down um we're going to go back and measure it but then we might come to you also we have a potential biocontrol agent this puccinia we might come out and try to inoculate some of the patches that patch yeah, here if you don't mind. Great. um so we can see how it works yeah Yeah, we, we were we were searching for patches this year and I remember going down going down Spring Hill or Rocky Mountain Road and I was like, oh, I was like, I think I know who that patch was. I didn't know there were spies, but I, I can definitely help you out. <laughs> Sorry, there's not too many. Just we were the Nat, we were the Canada thistle. We were yeah. No, we're, we're I feel like I've been Canada thistle on the side of the road. I've been living in a freaking fishbowl for 35 years now. You, it helps you develop thick skin. <laughs> hmm. uh, any more questions? We're, we're at an hour, uh, over an hour, actually. Um, hey, Tim, did uh, Casey have any natural disease or anything going on in his thistle? He did not have any natural disease going on in that field. I should double check with Dan Chichinsky. He'll give the presentation. We'll talk about it, but I'm pretty sure 
He did not. And in the first year of that project, I went out and harvested those plots myself and we hadn't mowed over it. And man, it was a horrible, horrible job. Um, and this year when we went back, Pat had mowed over the top of them in June, I believe. And it really, we almost have a twofold lower amount of thistle in the plots just by that one mowing over the year. So I think that's one of the things we're going to be working on as part of that project is try to integrate some of these other tools in. We have the Puccinia, we have the rotation experiment that we have and how to prevent thistle from really getting out there. But then I think we're looking to add in the next year or so, you know, what can we, what else can we do to, to work on that? We'll talk about that on the second. Yeah, in general, we found that we don't really worry about thistle very much in our pasture hay systems because the combination of um, grazing and sometimes strategic timing of mowing, it really keeps the thistle from spreading. And thistle is 18% protein, so it's really not a bad feed for sheep. But in cultivated systems, it's a lot less easy to tolerate it. And um, we had even had some discussion of mowing the tops off the thistle in the lamb quarter in this field, early in the season, Nate had Jim Barngrover come and look at it. And Jim was super casual about it. He thought, oh, we can handle those stuff. We may have to swath that, those lentils before we harvest them. But I think Jim is used to observing fields with a lot less moisture. I don't think he's used to a forest of lamb's quarter. <laughs> so um, the lamb's quarter is something to celebrate in a way it indicates pretty good fertile soil in, in a lot of respects, but it means we have a, a giant seed bank. But the mowing strategy, I think, makes a lot of sense. Pete Fay used to talk about this when he was at Extension, and um, I can't remember. I think he had some tool that he developed expressly for that purpose of uh, decapitating thistle when a crop was still going. Yeah, interesting. It was interesting. So we took the Canada thistle. We collected a whole bunch of seeds off the plots and we've been counting seed heads to see how many seeds are in there. And this is one of the parts of the project we're trying to address. But we planted 200 seeds in the greenhouse the other day just to see how well they were germinating. And actually Canada thistle is a horrible, horrible at germinating seed. It's not like kochia or cheatgrass, it just really has a pretty, the seeds aren't all that viable. They don't seem to stay there. You know, it's probably these one in a, you know, one in a million events where seeds establish very well. And then those patches become, exist and are there for a relatively long time. Um, so probably the, that seed reproduction of thistle is probably relatively rare. At least that's starting to be my general impression. I don't know if you guys have different impression out there, but that'd be my general impression that it's relatively rare to get a new patch of thistle that starts by seed, but maybe I'm wrong on that. Yeah, I think it's mostly spreading underground. One of the, speaking of thistles, since I have way too much experience with thistles, um, one of the things we found in our vegetable area, we had an area that was leased for a few years and um, long story short, that lease ended and there was a, a substantial section which was nearly solid thistle and bindweed. It was very alarming. And it was so depressing to me that I kept that section in cover crop for several years. Um, and it eventually, it looked like hell at first, but eventually developed a pretty good stand of mostly sandfoin and clover that we put in there. And I've been hanging it for several years. And then this past summer, Nate Brown came in and really worked it up pretty extensively in the spring. Um, probably let it, oh, I don't know, sat for maybe three weeks to do some germinating of whatever was in there. And then he worked it up again and he planted uh, mostly carrots and some winter squash and some beets. and. It was beautiful. And there, he came in with a weeding crew, I think really twice, mostly just one big crew over the course of the season. 
and then also did some machine cultivation, I think twice over the whole season. And it was pretty much zero thistle problem and minimal bindweed problem. Um, so a few years of a perennial diverse cover crop can really help out with a nasty setup like that. Yeah, do people ever use that strategy in transition? Um, do they just say, okay, I have this field, I'm just gonna put it in a perennial forage for three to five years till I'm certified and then from there, um, move into organic production or annual crop production? That's essentially the plan on this field that we've got. And after this initial, the field was raw plowed land when we got it. So it made sense to stick something in there, but, um, but for the next two, three, four years, it will be a combination of cover crop, hay, grazing, and we'll kind of play it by ear depending on how it behaves. Yeah, some of the research out in New Zealand really shows they, and by the way, they call it Californian thistle in New Zealand, not Canada <laughs> thistle. So in New Zealand, they've showed that really mowing and perennial cover for a few years, you can really weaken those stands of Canada thistle. Californian thistle. <laughs> I might start to use that term. <laughs> I keep trying to tell Pat Carr we should start calling it Californian thistle, but he, because Perry Miller is Canadian and doesn't like for us to call it Canada thistle. <laughs> no. Perry always calls it creeping thistle. Yeah, and that's what I, that's what he called in Britain. And yeah, so he always, yeah, creeping thistle. Yeah. Exactly. How about creepy thistle? <laughs> yeah, yeah the, the, the challenge with, with those types of systems for transition is just, uh, earning earning enough income from it uh, at, at scale and generally in transition I'm familiar with you know you, you usually start with clean fields uh, and they they don't emerge until you uh, you take the the input away but. well that's where integrating livestock into systems can really help because that can allow you to generate income from cover crops Absolutely. Do you guys as organic producers see more need for better um, better infrastructure to increase, the, to, to increase, you know, cause someone told me I was giving a talk in Stanford and someone said, you know, Dave Wichman's been talking about cover crops for weeds control for 30 years and he can't, he still can't get us to adopt it. And do you guys think it's a, a lack of infrastructure that would allow us to use some of these more alternative weed? I think of it from my perspective as having a, even an annual forage crop in there works great as a weed control tool. You know, Becky's talking about mowing down the lambs quarter and things like that to wear that seed bank down. Are we missing that sort of system or infrastructure to be able to better utilize that in Montana? I, I may just lack creativity, but I really think it's economics, Tim. Okay. You know, if, if we can get $300 an acre or more from, a, from an organic crop, it's pretty tough to put that into a, a cover crop in a cash crop year. Uh, now, we're, we're trying to focus on, on the years that are already, um, you know, green manure <laughs> and, and focus our efforts on those years. Um, and, and uh, I talked a little bit this morning about a perennial phase that we think we can cycle in, um, partially to manage perennial weeds that increase, uh, but that, that's still a work in progress. It's just- Is there a market out there for like Kernza or anything? I know it doesn't yield very well after a couple of years, but I was wondering maybe if Sam, is there a market out there for Kernza or the, the, the perennial wheat, um, Wheatgrass cross? Yeah, I don't, I mean, it, yes, but it just wouldn't be economical. I mean, we could make flowers out of it. There's not a, there's not a demand specifically for some of those, or there is, but it's a very small sector. Um, Steve over at Washington State, you know, I know he's looked into that a lot more just because he was raising some of that perennial wheat there for several years. Um, 
but to answer your ultimate question, no, there's there's not a major demand out there for it. I think, Tim, in some respects, you, you've asked the ultimate systems question because I think some people would argue that one of the reasons many soils have gotten into trouble with weed issues is because there's been too much repetition of the same crops. I'm not talking organic systems now. Um, and it, we're operating in a universe where people are accustomed to getting crop insurance for a failed year, whether it's weather or some other lack of resilience has, has kept them from succeeding. And you know, before we had the current iteration of the farm bill, organic farmers, normal farmers used to have diversity be their crop insurance. Um, and I think that in the long run, um, people are gonna start returning to that way of thinking because they're gonna be forced to. Um, it isn't really clear what direction USDA and Congress are gonna go in the next 10 years, but I think the climate and other issues may force us to make these kinds of changes to our economic system that would encourage a different way of managing weeds. Yeah, I mean, even from conventional producers, conventional crop consultants, I'll say even more, every one of them is like, man, if we could only get rid of fallow, I hate managing weeds and fallow. And it's because they back themselves into the corner of herbicide resistance and they, and people recognize it. And fallow is a point where you're like, the, the weeds look at the fallow and they're like tabula rasa full, you know, the blank slate, it's full of nutrients. It's full of, there's no competition. And then when you come at them with herbicides, they basically, they start to burn tools away and having a green cover on there, having plant competition, it is all really important for a lot of, a lot of those, a lot of people too. So I think it's really, yeah, yeah. The, um, the crop insurance system is, is the real driver of um, monoculture and of fallow and until we change that, you're not going to reduce fallow and you're not going to get rid of, of monoculture. Uh, it's just the economics are too strong and the, the, they're not backed up. It, it's, it's not reflective of current science, but there's still a huge disincentive to grow anything but wheat and to, to get out of the fallow cycle. Yeah, that's true. Georgiana also added a, an additional note, um, said some seed cleaners say that part of the thistle problem has increased due to lack of seed cleaning when producers are using saved seed. So that's another variable, although I would agree with Doug that that's, um, that's not the main driver. Okay, we're almost at an hour and a half. Any um closing thoughts. Um, I guess I would say there's a, a lot of sessions this week that this will uh, serve as a really good basis for. So hope to see you at those. Becky and Tim. Thank you, Jamie, for making it all happen. Yeah, thanks for making it all happen. If anyone, I'll see if I can get to my contact information as fast as I can. Oh, there we go. Here's my contact information if anyone has any questions um and i'm all i love talking about this stuff i like farming i like ecology and i like how it all interacts so if anyone ever wants to talk about it call me up thanks tim yeah thanks tim mm -hmm. so guys. we'll have a recording of this posted and um i think the slides will be available too right tim yep i'll send you the slides Well, thanks, everyone. And thanks, Tim and Becky. Thanks, and everybody. Contributors.